and the Kazakh by and by law, personal necessity, without Kali, has worked on Lukic policy, and she has our economic department for Sarajo, without being of the student of, uh, of the students who are here. There are some other guys here, because there is a uh, person in the side, the professor of uh, system dynamics, for the Chita Kumumala, he is Dr. Bongin, Kansa Bongin, and he is Ryan, and uh, she has the first thesis on in the area of evaluation of intangibles there. And there are some other colleagues, I think I don't see, but I welcome all of them. Just in there, you can come forward. Bargul, come. Bargul is from Mr. Kamp. She is from Mr. Clay, and she is from Mr. Strategy here. Uh, I welcome, and now I also will look forward to, uh, of course, you announce, but I think Professor Money has done a significant job. I am sure that. I know we will travel with him uh, to you know, an exciting fair. For the first time, I think uh, uh, we find a very good treatment uh, of you know, how to measure what is happening in the field of uh, uh, innovations. These come out with different kind of indicators that really very, very interesting indicators. He talks of the country, he talks of the states, he talks of the government policy there, he talks of rich countries, he mentions, you know, a lot about uh, China there. I find the whole thing, I think, uh, for anybody, I think, Commoner uh, also doesn't use much of science and technology. We find something a very good treatment of the problem. It's a very forceful, you know, forceful presentation. And I'm sure that today, uh, by the time uh, we finish this lecture, we will have a better understanding of science and technology. Innovations, the role innovations play. I'll just take the last few words in Japan, Japan today. If France is France today, and if India is India today, it is all because the innovative mind and the frame of mind that we have in the area of science and technology. And I think I am sure uh, that uh, we will improve on that score in time to come. Once again, I extend a very, very hearty welcome. So we are extremely grateful to the new teacher on Dias for spending that valuable time uh, for coming over here to ask you to talk to me money. Uh, who I know I'm a very, very busy person, I know, but could uh, accede to our request of finding some time and coming and I think talking to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I now request Professor Sunil Mani to deliver the distinguished lecture.
and so this is the character GDP which you so you find two bars there, one is the old one and the current one. And what basically what you see is that India is the fifth largest. But our size of our economy is only half of what China is. Very often we are compared with almost as if we are equal to China. And, uh, and that's because of our population size that, that is equal. But in terms of uh, the size of the economy, India is only one half of China. Okay, I think that point has to be first born in mind before we start uh, self-congratulating ourselves and start equating with China. Because uh, for a number of uh, innovation indicators also, China is doing far better than India. And, and of course, India is also doing better in certain other ways. So that's the first point. The second point is that, uh, this is of course pretty well known, uh, that India's growth rates have actually started picking up since 1991, and specifically since 2000. This whole 9% growth rate is actually since 2000. And another interesting feature about India's growth, which is of course quite well known, this particular graphic is quite well known, uh, is the fact that uh, much of the growth is actually coming from the services sector, and not from the manufacturing sector. Now you have uh, you know, you know, some, some dangerous signals coming from there because you see you can't uh, depend too much on services because the services will have to be connected to a manufacturing sector which is also growing. Because it so happens that our services sector uh, in our economy is actually linked to the manufacturing sectors elsewhere. Okay? So if you look at for instance our IT services, uh, over 98% of IT services are actually exported to the West. Now if something happens to the manufacturing sector abroad, uh, and, uh, that, uh, you know, that can be deleting its effect on the service sector here as well. And that's precisely what you see right now in the global financial crisis where the, where the markets abroad are actually decelerating or uh, in, 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 and there's a recession. And so that is actually slowly getting affected in our own economy and such. But our service sector has uh, also become quite innovative. And in fact, I shall, um, I, I shall show you some indicators later on. And in fact, within the service sector, the most of the innovations are actually not coming from Indian entities. It is actually from foreign entities which are operating from India. So uh, uh, I think this is a point which I shall prove it later on. So again, when we say India is becoming innovative, you have to ask the question whether we are really becoming innovative if you simply invite multinational companies to come and uh, uh, to operate from our own economy and they use our human resource and do research here and then secure patents. Uh, you, you call that India becoming innovative or not. Okay. The next point, the third point that I wish to make in terms of the overall context is that the knowledge intensity of India's production has also increased. Okay. So this is the knowledge intensity of India's GDP. And, uh, and so, uh, and in fact, as the note one clearly states how the knowledge intensity has been actually measured. You can say that about 40% of India's GDP is actually composed of knowledge intensive products and services. Okay. So that I think is another interesting uh, feature which is actually taking place. Not only has our growth rate gone up, but the knowledge intensity of our production has also increased during this period and currently it is uh, approximately 14%. And, and of course one can actually quarrel over the way in which I have actually measured knowledge intensity and so on. But that can be taken as a point of debate uh, later on. But for argument's sake, I think uh, the, the point to be noted is that the knowledge intensity of India's production, domestic production, has actually increased. The next point is that since 1991, we also see that there has been an explosion of entrepreneurship in our country. A number of new companies have actually been set up. A very large number of new companies have been set up. For instance, if you look at the new company formation in India since 1991, it is something like 33,000 companies per year on an average compared to about 16,000 between 1981 and 1991, okay? So 1981 to 1991, 16,000 companies per year were formed. But in uh, 1991 to 2007, it's something like uh, uh, 33,000 new companies were being formed. And of the 33,000 companies, a large number of these companies are actually in knowledge-intensive service segments. So that's actually what is shown by the uh, red line, which is going up over here. So which means, uh, apart from knowledge, your production going up, you also see that the knowledge intensity of the uh, new company formation has also increased and so on. And India has become a major, Indian companies have become multinational companies on their own right. There are many, many, very, very major Indian acquisitions abroad during this period, especially since 2000. And, uh, and in fact, last year, for instance, uh, uh, two years ago, we have had uh, very, very high profile acquisitions abroad, like for instance, Tata's takeover of Corus and so on. 
and, and, and uh, you can see that if you actually run through this list of uh, Indian companies which are actually going abroad and taking over uh, multinational companies, especially in Western countries, you find that most of these companies are also doing that partly to do with acquiring technologies and acquiring operatives in technologies. For instance, you would have heard about a company called Suslo, which manufactures wind turbines. And the wind turbine industry in India is not that well developed. And then, but if you look at Suslo in the wind turbine industry, it is now the, the third largest wind turbine manufacturing company in the world. Okay. Same case with Bharat Forge, uh, which is a forging company. It's one, become one of the largest forging companies in the world. Okay. Although our own forging, domestic forging industry is quite small. And, uh, and, and this is because these companies have actually gone abroad, acquired these companies, and through that process, acquired the uh, technological capability in those areas. And they have become uh, uh, multinational companies in their own right. So this is another uh, 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 feature which is actually taking place. So if you look at Indian investments abroad, if you take the ratio of foreign direct investments to India, from India, I'm sorry, uh, uh, from India to India, it, it, is, uh, it, it is something like, uh, in, uh, it is almost something like 0.5, I think, uh, in the, almost 0.6 in, in the recent period, which means Sit up of uh, the foreign direct investments which are actually flowing from India is almost at 60% of the foreign direct investments which are coming to India. All these years we have been talking about India as a net importer of capital. Now we have all of a sudden become an exporter of capital. And, uh, and so that I think is a very interesting uh, new uh, uh, development in the post 1991 scene. And this, as I've been saying, has happened specifically since 2000. In fact, uh, as I can tell you it later on, also statistically, uh, uh, although the liberalization started in 1997, the significant break in the trend seems to have happened within this period since uh, around 1997 or around uh, 97 to 2003. And I shall prove that with the help of Beijing's data entry a little later on. So, okay. And are these Indian investments which are abroad, are they simply to acquire uh, or grab markets abroad, for instance? If TCS wants to expand to Latin America, um, and, uh, they do, and you know much of Latin America is Spanish speaking, and, uh, and uh, so if they want to expand their markets to Latin America, it, it, it's sensible for them to take over, uh, you know, Spanish speaking companies instead of setting up their own, uh, you, know, you know, branches there and uh, taking Indians there and making them learn French, Spanish, which they can never do uh, to the fullest extent possible. And, uh, and especially given the technical uh, uh, technical details and so on. So, uh, uh, and, and so the feeling was that uh, a lot of these Indian investments were essentially to expand markets, grab markets abroad and so on. But this doesn't seem to be the case because if you look at the profits and dividends which are actually repatriated on Indian investments abroad, that has also been increasing. In fact, profits and dividends which are actually repatriated on the basis of Indian investments abroad uh, to, uh, to profits and dividends repatriated on the basis of multinational companies which are operating from India is something like 0.1. Yeah, so even within a short period of time, you can see that uh, these Indian investments have gone have been quite profitable. Been quite profitable. So that's another uh, new feature which has actually happened to that. Uh, the next feature is that uh, uh, not, at the same time, although I've been showing you now uh, uh, certain macro indicators to show that India is becoming you know, technologically speaking, capable in the sense of Indian companies being able to acquire the knowledge intensity of our domestic production has increased. Indian companies are able to take over multinational companies abroad and make profits out of that investments and repatriate those properly and so on. And the other one, the second route is to disembodied technology imports, which is in the form of licensing, taking the law over and so on. And traditionally speaking, imported technology imports have been much higher. So if you take the ratio of uh, imported to disembodied, it's always been uh, uh, greater than one. In fact, it is almost uh, 24, uh, uh, 24 times, and it is actually increasing. If you take the most recent period, it is actually increasing again. So it yeah, continues to depend on technology imports to imported technology imports uh, during this uh, during this period. And the next point is that uh, former channels of uh, but this can actually be a little bit misleading because. Uh, imported technology imports and disimported technology imports are formal channels through which technology is actually imported by Indian companies. Now, these formal channels have actually become quite difficult because it has been proved by uh, two researchers from, uh, from abroad, 
In fact, one of them is actually in India, from Carnegie Mellon University. But the market for this supporting technologies in the West has actually been huge in terms of its size. Okay. And, and uh, so, if you want to purchase technology from abroad, it is not that easy as it, 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 it was several years ago. And so, as a result, what you can see is that the share of uh, informal channels in technology imports have been increasing. So the red line which is going up is the informal channels. And informal channels are basically business management and consultancy. And the source of all this data is actually from India and balance of payments. And that's the only official source from where you can get this data. And this is uh, compiled by the uh, Reserve Bank of India. And, and you have the latest data available up to 2007 okay. And, and uh, so that clearly shows that uh, uh, can, can the companies in India has been depending much more on another, I mean, informal channels, which is basically business management and consultancy form of uh, that you, you get, you invite a consultant, it's not buying the technology in the form of a licensing or know-how because that's not possible anymore. It's difficult, or, or even if it's possible, it's difficult. The price is too high, the restrictions, the, the conditions are too high and so on. And, and so uh, uh, companies have started using consultants. So now basically what I'm trying to say is that because of this, uh, it, it is necessary for companies to invest in local te development of technology. And whether that has whether that has really happened or not, is what we are going to actually look at in the next term. And then again, you find that India has become extremely competitive in certain high-tech areas. For instance, if you look at uh, space technology, okay, India is, uh, uh, and this is a, a kind of an index which is actually completed by a company called Futron Corporation in the US. Futron is actually a consultancy company based in the United States, which is actually very specialized in uh, looking at space technologies, aerospace technologies to be, to, to be precise. Yeah, which is astronautics plus aeronautics. Okay. And you find that uh, India is, uh, and, and they've computed this index, and this index has got actually three components. The government, the competence of the government, the competence of the private sector, and the and competence of the human resource. And this is combined, and a, a, a composite index is actually prepared, and countries are actually ranked according to the value of the uh, in, in that index. And you can see that, uh, uh, the, uh, as you can expect, the United States has come number one, followed by European Union, and then you have Russia, and then you have China and India almost neck to neck uh, each other. Okay. And if you look at that, uh, within the graphic, uh, and this data refers to about 2008, so this is a very recent data. Okay. And within the graphic, if you look at uh, the, the last part of the bar, which is the industry part, and you can see that uh, although China and India are almost neck to neck, Indian industry in terms of space technologies are actually slightly more competitive than Chinese. Chinese. Okay. And uh, so, so you find a kind of a very paradoxical situation here where in certain areas of high technology we are extremely competitive and certain areas of low technology we are simply not competitive at all and we still have to depend on, uh, design, uh, and depend on import of foreign technology uh, and so on. For instance, when I was working in IPE, one of the research projects that I did for the Department of Scientific Industry Research was to actually de develop a technology profile of the state of other place in terms of uh, imported technologies. So I went through every single foreign collaboration which was actually contracted by companies which were based in the uh, state of other place during the period, I think, of, from 1975 to 1989 or so. And during that period, I found several companies in other place entering into foreign collaborations for manufacturing lunch boxes. So what I'm trying, so this is precisely the point that I'm trying to say is that while at the same uh, at one level we are extremely competitive in certain areas like space space technologies and aerospace technologies, for instance, we have uh, 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 this. Not many people know that we have something like 300 firms in Hyderabad and Bangalore which are actually extremely active in aerospace technologies, doing a range of activities. Okay? And you have a society of Indian Aerospace Industries Association, which is actually formed, and, and, and this is becoming quite active in the last few years. So you, you find a kind of a dualistic kind of situation there. Now coming to uh, looking at some broad indicators, and I, and I shall take up some of these broad indicators also uh, in my second part of the lecture when I am specifically going to look at and answering this question about the case with more attention. Now here, if you look at, uh, I put together the data from a World Bank publication which was done in 2007 called Ambition Innovation, uh, edited by one uh, that, that's there. And, uh, and uh, in that you have this Brazil, Russia, India, China, because now, nowadays we talk about BRICS, 
as uh, you know, and they compare these countries because they are roughly comparable in terms of the size of the economy and the direction of growth and so on. And you find some interesting results there. If you look at both 1.1 and 1.2, which is the last one, uh, you can see that uh, uh, India spent something like 5 billion US dollars. Uh, this is uh, the total expenditure on R&D okay, per year. 5.9, about 6 billion dollars uh, India spent. Whereas China is actually spending during exactly the same period about uh, close to about 28 billion dollars. Okay. India spends 5 billion dollars and it gets 376 US credits. China spends about 28 billion dollars and it gets off, uh, gets just about uh, 567 patents or so. So if you take the average uh, average patents, so that you can make comparisons across countries, because you know the absolute numbers you cannot compare across space. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and as I clearly pointed out in the first slide itself, that China is two times the size of India. So naturally you cannot compare uh, China, India's R&D, just the absolute amount. So if you look at the average R&D spending to secure, India spends 15.69 million million dollars to get one US patent, whereas China has to spend something like 46 million dollars. Okay, so that shows something which is very interesting as far as the productivity of invest, uh, research investments in India concerned. And in fact, you can see that India, among the BRIC countries, is the most productive in terms of research investments. Okay, and uh, and I think this is something which has to be, and this keeps coming in all kinds of comparisons later on, also when you use uh, for instance total factor productivity growth between India and China when correctly specified and compared across the countries, or even incremental capital output ratios which measures the efficiency of the project management between India and China. India comes, surprisingly comes out better than China. Okay? And this is something which is interesting. This is just a hypothesis which we need to verify in greater detail. Okay? Whether this is a statistical artifact or not, which we, uh, which we have to bear in mind. Uh, so, so Basically, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, uh, the, although India has spent much less on uh, research and development, we seem to be much more highly productive. Okay? Our human resource seems to be much more highly productive. But we may be pushing our human resource to its ultimate limits. And, and so that's a point that I think uh, uh, I, I will take up uh, a, 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 little, a little later. So now, so I completed the first part of my presentation. Basically, just to summarize, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it has become the fifth largest economy in the world. And overall growth rates of the GDP have increased. And the knowledge intensity of the overall growth rate has actually increased in uh, approximately 14%. Indian companies have been going abroad and taking over technology-oriented companies abroad. And some Indian companies have become world multinationals. Uh, I, I gave the specific names of uh, Suslon, Suslon in the area of wind turbine, Barrett Forge in the case of uh, Forge and so on. And this Indian foreign direct investments have become extremely productive in terms of the large amounts of dividends and profits being repatriated back to India. And, and Indian research system seems to be also quite productive. And uh, the companies here seem to be depending much more on informal channels to import technology rather than formal channels. So these are the kind of general points that can be obtained from the, and, and in certain areas of high technology, we seem to be extremely uh, competitive. But, all that I have been talking about so far is only with reference to 11% of our economy. Because only about 11% of our economy is actually in the formal sector. So which means that a large proportion of our economy is actually in the informal sector. Okay. So all this high performance and other things that I am talking about refers only to this 11%. Okay. And if you look at the size of the manufacturing sector within that 11%, it's only about 28%. Okay. So now, uh, if you're talking about the innovations and so on, you are actually talking only about a very small segment of our economy. And I think that point will have to be borne in mind uh, before we start talking about uh, whether the has is any innovative or not. Otherwise, I think we tend to miss the picture. I think this is the same point which Professor Mustafa also seems to be making uh, during this discussion. Now let me go on to the second part of my presentation where I'm actually going to ask Squire uh, and answer this question, is India becoming more innovative or not? And people working in the area of economics of innovation use a variety of indicators and the one indicator which they tend to use is first the input indicators, that is the, the input for innovation. 
and, uh, and power is typically measured input for uh, innovation in terms of the amount of money which is spent to uh, create that activity, which is normally capture it in the form of uh, expenditure on R&D. Okay? So you have the gross expenditure on R&D, which is GERD. The source of data is the biennial uh, service conducted by the Department of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. And that's the only official source of data which we have. Okay. And, uh, uh, and the latest data which is uh, released by the DST refers to 2007-8. So we have the data both in current and constant terms. And in constant terms, what we have done is we have taken the current uh, data and we have adjusted it for inflation. Because if you look at long time series data, uh, and, and you know uh, the growth rates in, in normal terms can be uh, highly misleading because uh, because we also have inherent inflation, so we have to actually adjust for inflation. So that's why that's why we have taken the growth expenditure R&D in constant terms, and this has been taken in constant terms in 99-2000 prices. Okay, because that is the current base year which is used by the Central Statistical Organization. And I've divided the series into two pre and post liberalisation. So, and you have the growth rates which are given there. And you also have the last column, which is the research intensity, which is the gross expenditure on R&D divided by the GDP, and multiplied by 100, okay? So that's uh, given on the last, uh, uh, last column. Now, the basic points that you can come up, uh, you can make out from this particular analysis is that both in current and constant terms, actually the constant growth rates are not worked out and given there, but I will actually look yeah, it is there. Um, uh, you can see that uh, uh, in the post liberalization period, gross expenditure on R&D has actually not shown any increase at all. In fact, it's shown a decline. Okay, both in current and constant terms. In current terms, it has actually gone down from 18% per annum to 16% per annum. Of course, it has dropped by 16%, but compared to the previous period, it has actually declined. So there is actually a decline in R&D expenditure. And in constant terms, it has gone from 9 to 7 percent. So, although it has gone at 7 percent, but still it has declined uh, with this gross expenditure. Now, here I have to uh, make some comments about the data because India's R&D expenditure is extremely peculiar compared to any other country in the world for the simple reason that India's gross expenditure on R&D is largely composed of expenditure in different space, academic energy and agriculture. Okay? And the amount of R&D which is expected by the industrial sector is not very high. Although its share has been increasing, as I will show you, I will show you in a minute or so, it's not been very high. If you look at the similar kind of picture for China, for instance, China, almost 64% of the R&D expenditure is actually performed and expected by the industrial sector. China was like India in 1979 at the time when they liberalized. And, uh, but they, now they have become almost like investing other Western capitalist countries, where large amounts of R&D is actually uh, done by the industry. And this is indeed the case, if you look at a country like Japan, for instance, almost 98% of the R&D is actually done by the industry. If you look at Korea, for instance, it's a uh, proportion of something like 80%. Okay? To that extent, India is very unique among all the major big countries or, or among all other countries as well. And the research intensity of India has also not shown any increase. In fact, we are not spending even 1% of our GDP on R&D. In fact, you can see that uh, the, the research intensity has, well, well I mean, it has increased very uh, insignificantly from 0.76 to 0.78. You know, for statistically speaking, that's not an increase at all. So it's virtually remained constant, you, you would say. It's not a, a statistically significant uh, increase at all. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so, and in fact, if you look, if you compare that with China, the China's uh, research intensity compared to India's 0.78 for the current period is about 1.1.4 1. 1. and almost going to 1.5 right now. Okay, and if you look at countries like uh, Korea and so on, it's close to 2%. And even a country like Singapore, for instance, has spending something like 1.8% of its GDP on uh, on uh, research endeavor. So our overall research intensities adjusted for inflation or in terms of uh, uh, the proportion of our GDP has not shown an increase at all during this period. So I think this is an important point. And if you remember, in 2003, we had a science and technology policy. And in that policy document, you will find a particular statement that uh, uh, India, had, by 2007-8, India should uh, devote at least 2% of its uh, GDP to gross expenditure on R&D. 
So that particular target is not having. We use a term called the national system of innovation. So in the national system of innovation, you have three broad agents or actors. The first actor is the government. The second actor is the industry, which consists of both public sector and private sector enterprises. And the last sector is the higher education system, which is basically the universities and so on. Okay. And if you look at the sector composition of uh, the, uh, the performance of R&D, where R&D is actually performed, you can see that uh, the share of government has actually now during this liberalization period gone down. Okay. If you take 1991, it was something like 86% of the R&D was actually performed, funded and performed by the government. Right now, it's only about 65%. Okay. This includes the CSA laboratories as well. Okay. And uh, so it has actually gone down. And the share of the industrial sector has, in, in fact, has actually increased. It's increased from about 13% uh, in, in 1991 to almost 30%. So there has been a tremendous increase in the share of, uh, of uh, the industrial sector. And the industrial sector, as I said, is composed of both public sector enterprises and private sector enterprises. And I can show you a little later that it is largely private sector enterprises which have actually expanded the share during this period. And, and again, the source of the data is the DST R&D survey, which is the only official source that we have, and, and so on. There is another source, which is basically the CMI, the Center for Monitoring Engine Economy, and they have a data set called the Prowess, and it is possible for you to get the R&D expenditures of uh, companies from the Prowess data set as well. And if you add up all the data from the Prowess and compare that to the DST, they are now, uh, although there was some difference in the early period, Increasingly, the, uh, the two data sets actually are almost equal, almost equal for uh, quite a similar in terms of sensitivity analysis as far as the data is concerned. Now, what you can see is that the higher education system uh, in our country hardly does any research. It's only about four. This includes, by the way, the IITs, the Indian Institute of Science and so on. Okay? And the higher education system uh, is only about 4.4% uh, of 